Team 1, 3.30 p.m., Lorton. Winston looked out the window to the chaos that was the train platform. Mothers crying for their sons, fathers hugging their daughters, lovers denying separation as if it were their last night on the eve of a war. He searched the crowd, hoping to catch a glimpse of his parents, but they refused to see him off. The boy grabbed the string that lay dangling beside him and closed the curtain. He pulled apart the drawstring bag that was settled on his lap and turned over its contents of clothes and minimal toiletries for the book that rusted on the bottom. Winston placed his bag carefully under his seat and pulled down the worn paperback that sat on his lap. He turned the cover and the flyleaf, the copyright and blank pages, with the table of contents, the editor's preface, and finally began reading. Anything to distract him from love, familial, romantic, or self. A man climbed the stairs and stomped down the corridor in mudded chocolate boots. Winston peered over the tops of the seats ahead of him as the man looked every direction for his seat label, constantly glancing at his ticket. He wore a garnet flannel with the sleeves rolled to his elbows. His arms filled it well enough that they screamed intimidation. The man came into view of the panel labeled above Winston and smiled, in which he showed a blinding set of white. He crashed into the seat and his ox-like shoulders dominated the armrest on which the boy was resting. The man's duffel thumped as it landed on the floor between his legs. Hey, bud. He said in a deep, purebred Virginian pride. Looks like we're coach partners. He extended his hand. Winston nodded and gave the type of smile a white person uses when they lock eyes with a person of color walking opposite them on the sidewalk. He met the man's palm and was greeted with a grip similar of an ungodly vice. The contrast of Winston's soft fingertips to the man's callous digital creases made the boy lurch in amusement. Travis. The brute released the boy's hand, much to Winston's dis dismay. The boy shook the crushed remains of his palm and flexed his fingers to rid the sting, but he wished it stayed a little longer. Winston and Travis looked up as a woman waddled through the aisle, calling out of her daughter who seated herself behind the pair. The woman clutched her purse and peered at the passengers she passed, examining each one in disgust as a potential thief of the tampons that poked through the zipper of the J. Crew Leopard print. She passed Winston and Travis with repulsion. Winston peered over his seat and caught his attention on her plum leggings, bedazzled with juicy across the backside and cursive. The woman ducked under the baggage compartments of her head and lifted the armrests into the back of the seat. She sat down and took over both spots with her hips. Travis and Winston both turned to one another. Travis raised his eyebrows and smirked. Winston shrugged and tried not to laugh. They creepily turned back to the woman. She talked and groaned slurred words over her phone. Winston tried to decipher the inane dribbling spewing from the woman's mouth as she was complaining about her daughter over the phone, even though the teenage girl was no more than five feet away. He heard something about her ungratefulness, her lack of ambition, and something about a sweet dime store whore, as the woman bluntly put it. Winston began to wonder how a parent could talk about their child in such a manner, then remembered he was no longer a son to his parents. A mother's love, a father's love, it all meant nothing to Winston, at least at that moment. He thought of the classmate he was found in bed with the week prior. His father's hands ripping him from his sheets. His mother's pride and the shame she would have to hide. Winston felt sick to his stomach and he swallowed hard. He gripped his own neck and let his fingers stay there. He pressed and forgot where he was for a while. The bedroom? No. The train. Mother? No. Just a drunk woman. Father? No, just a man. The man. He looked at Travis and, oh God, have you seen him grip his own throat? No, the cap was tipped over his eyes. Probably sleeping now. Winston studied Travis for a minute. He had tawny curls that were suppressed and smothered under his cap, faded and threadbare. Olive with an apple colored B with silver trim that protruded from the center. Huh. Fox fan, Winston thought. His father was, is, a Red Sox fan. His father. 
What about his father? He blinked that thought away, and he stared at Travis again. Copper skin, dirty nails, honey-colored scruff. Winston's guest was a handyman of some sort, a grease monkey type. And oh, oh, Winston took a double take at the man's scruff. Against the grain, huh? Someone didn't teach him how to shave. The boy nodded and bit his lip as he looked back out the window. Maybe he wasn't the only one with daddy issues, Winston thought. He shook his head and scoffed at such an idea. He then picked up his book from his lap, opened it, and sifted through the needless dozen pages. Once more, he began. The train left the station just after 4 p.m. Scene <laughs> 2, 5 p.m., somewhere in Virginia. So are you going to tell me what's up, or are you just going to keep pretending to read? Winston blinked away from his book and looked at a burrowed Travis. From what Winston could see, the Virginian's eyes were closed under his cap. What? You've been stuck on the same page for the past ten minutes. Travis sat up straight and popped his shoulder. He made a solid knock as he cracked it. He took his cap off and pushed his curls back and smothered them once more. Winston stared. How could he have known? You haven't turned the page. I would have heard the paper fold. What a fox, thought Winston. Just haven't been able to concentrate. Long day is all. Winston rested his head on his fist as he leaned on the armrest. Travis nodded and motioned to the worn paperback. Shakespeare. It's a collection of his sonnets. You really like Shakespeare? Travis raised an eyebrow. Like unironically? Like unironically. It's not for everyone. Shakespeare can be a drag. Well, then why read him? Travis turned and dug his shoulder into the seat. Winston shrugged and stretched out his fingers. Come on. Why do you read him? Or better yet, why aren't you reading him? I read him to get away, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I know sonnets by heart. It's just kind of a medium to distract me, so I don't have to think about anything else. Distract yourself from what? Myself. Are you asking me or telling me? I'd rather not tell you anything. That was me telling you. Part of the boy wanted to punch Travis, as if it were any of his business what he was going through, as if he was obligated to explain his troubles to a stranger. On the other hand, though, Travis was, well, Travis. Was he really that hard to resist? Give me one. What? Give me a sonnet. Tell it to me. What a game this man is playing, Winston thought. The boy inhaled and searched for the first sonnet that would come to mind. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Sonnet 116. Winston stared with amusement and placed his book over his zipper. He hoped Travis would take note of it. I studied British literature uh, down at Louisiana State. Winston's cheeks flushed as his tented paperback twitched over his crotch. Of course, Travis noticed, Winston thought, and his cheeks got brighter. Scene three. Do your glass half full. That is my turn. Rain or shine? Rain. My question back to you. Uh, you gotta give a reason. Rain has a ton of possibilities. You haven't seemed so pleased by it. Because there's different kinds of rain. Half empty or half full? Half empty. I can always refill it. What do you mean there's different rain? Winston turned and peeled the curtain open. Streaks of rain ran diagonally across the window, blurred by the moving landscape. 
it's not the same as the rain back home. Baltimore rain, it doesn't happen. Very seldom does it rain. When it does, though, it all comes down. It's a rain that forces strangers to seek shelter in a cafe. A cafe where those strangers become friends and one night stands. It's a rain that makes bicyclists pedal harder or slower if they're really feeling it, even though they risk the chance of getting their chains rusted. And there's the boys who strip and run about in puddles and nothing but their underwear. There's the couples who choose to keep playing games, their tennis games. It's a rain that forces people under canopies to hug and keep close to each other. It's all the tension within the city builds up for so long until, at least for a few hours, it just lets it out on everyone. Florida rain, that's nothing special. Everyone knows about it, everyone talks about it, everyone experiences it. That's not my rain. Winston shut the curtain. Travis nodded and looked down. It's a shame I won't be studying you in my lit courses. Oh yes, Travis. What a shame. Scene four, 6.30 p.m somewhere in the Carolinas. Winston stood in the water closet of the trans corridor. He washed his hands and became mesmerized by the trance of the water drowning his palms. He bent and splashed his face with the warm water, then flung his head back and settled his reflection into the mirror. He stared. Had his, had his eyebrows always been blonde? No, he would have noticed. But what color were they before if they hadn't been? Had he ever noticed? Had he ever even looked? Winston watched as the water droplets streamed diagonally down his face. Tears or rain? He wasn't sure. Winston, when was the last time you saw yourself? Winston thought long. Not saw, investigated. Truly, absolutely seen yourself. Never. He couldn't remember. The latch of the door wiggled. Occupied. He wiped his face dry with a paper napkin. He slapped his cheek softly with both hands. A knock. Occupied. A bang. And another. <gasps> Was that a scream? A woman. <laughs> Winston couldn't tell. The latch broke before he had a moment to think. <laughs> Scene five. Winston held an ice pack to his head. Say, what happened again? Asked the attendant. I said I was pissing. I was using the restroom. Then that crazy bitch woman, excuse me, started banging on the door, saying that she needed to use the bathroom. I said I'd be out in a minute. And that's when she broke through the door. That's when she broke through the door. And she started beating you with her purse? Yes. Winston looked over to the drunken woman as she lay detained on the floor next to the train security guard. She was mumbling about the... Nasty. And... Unbelievable treatment. She was experiencing. The daughter was speaking with another attendant. No, sir, I understand, but you can't. I've got school and- Miss, your mother broke a bathroom door down and beat another passenger. I'm sorry, but you're getting off at the Carolina border. Winston stared at the young girl. She was his age, he guessed. He watched as the girl and mother spilled hate onto one another. The woman was- A failure as a mom. And the girl was- a disappointment as a daughter. And the attendant between them ordered them. Both to cease. A child cannot control their parent. And what parent would treat their child like an object? Like a mother did not carry her child inside her for nine months only to slur and... All right, thought Winston. The boy stood and handed the ice pack to the stewardess. Excuse me. He stepped towards the small group. 
Do you mind if I... Uh, not to worry, sir. We'll get them off the train at the nearest stop and... No. No. No? The corridor fell silent, save for the attendant who cleared his throat. <clears throat> what about no? Winston peered at the attendant's name tag. Samuel? The attendant nodded. Samuel, I'll make a deal with you. You've got this, Winston. This lovely lady here. Motioning to the daughter. Is not in control of her mother's actions, and it's pretty fucked. Winston took a deep breath and twitched his lip. It's wrong of you to punish her. It was not her fault. Keep it going. You're doing good. I'll tell you what, I could easily press charges on the woman, but that would be bad press for you and your employer. The attendant boasted his chest and cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Bring it home, Winston. So, if you upgrade me to a roommate, I could look the other way. The attendants remained silent. The drunk woman breathed heavily through her mouth, enough to where the vibration of the phlegm in her throat filled the corridor. The daughter smiled at Winston. Sir, your upgrade isn't up to me. Well, make it. Oh, too, stand your groundish. Reel it in. Come on, reel it in. Sir, she beats you with a purse. I, I can't just turn a blind eye and- What you're told. Damn it, Winston, what about easing up? Unless, of course, you'd like me to get a hold of your corporate manager. Winston didn't even know if train lines had a corporate manager, but he felt proud, nonetheless. Like a white, middle-aged Karen in retail. Winston smirked at the thought. Wait, did the attendant notice the smirk? What if he did? Oh, what to do? Well, no time to do it. Unless maybe. Well. His eyes traveled around the corridor to the attendants. They all looked dumbfounded. Yes, sir. Good. When would the sir want his dinner served? Oh. 7.30. Anything to make the passenger happy. Scene six. When Winston returned to his seat, Travis was nowhere to be found. Where could he have gone? The boy retrieved his drawstring bag and the tattered copy of Shakespeare, ready to head to his new room, but hesitated. What about Travis? What about Travis? Winston sat on Travis's seat for a moment. The boy leaned back into the crevices of the upholstery and allowed it to subdue him like a bear. He looked around to make sure no one was watching and smelled it. A scent, a sign, a hair, anything? Anything, God, anything. Nothing, nothing but bourbon, bourbon and sensitive skin Barbasol. He couldn't imagine Travis any other way. The boy dug into his drawstring, pe drawstring for a pen, a pencil, a marker, whatever he may have packed. He was sure he had something in, oh, aha, a ballpoint. Winston took the cap between his teeth and flipped the pen toward one of the blank editor's pages. He began to write in his best penmanship, but also not his best, just in case he would think too hard and mess it up closed his paperback and stood, slung his drawstring over his shoulder and placed the bard on Travis's seat. Winston would wait for him. He would wait for the chase. Follow the breadcrumbs, Travis. For me. Scene seven, 7.45 p.m. Somewhere in the mid Carolinas. The bartender lit a fresh cigarette. Winston looked at the old man's name tag. Slow night, isn't it, Lloyd? Very slow, sir. He filled the boy's glass with tap water. Winston turned his bar stool around and took a slow gaze around the first class lounge. It was like a nighttime oil painting, with dark ebony wood paneling that absorbed all light. The only light being the dim sconces and the table lamps of Tiffany, 
amber colored glass. Smoke from cigarettes filled the atmosphere. Winston normally hated smoke with a passion. For some reason, in that moment, it felt right. The boy turned back toward the countertop and reached for the wine menu and flipped through its glossed pages. Whoa. Is it sweet or dry? I can't do dry. Yeah. Yeah. ID. Can I try a shot of it? Bartenders never know their own labels anymore. ID. Winston swallowed hard and retrieved his wallet and shifted his fingers into a back pocket to retrieve a fake he had gotten earlier that year. He may have only been 17 or back in Baltimore, but in Vermont he was 22. Lloyd raised a curious eye. He moved up and down from the driver's license of a smiling, ugly young man to a pale boy who looked as though his nutrition depended on cigarettes and iced coffee. Implanted on the right side of his honey mist auburn hair was a gray streak that stuck out like mold. Lloyd gave Winston the license back and poured him a white from Woodridge. The boy smiled. Scene eight. Winston was on his eighth glass when Lloyd cut him off. Oh, come on, Lloyd, one more. Son, you've had plenty. Can't you let a kid drink? What do you think I've been doing for the past two hours? Lloyd leaned in toward the boy and wiped the countertop with a rag. He swatted some shy cigarette ashes onto the floor. I know you're not 22, son, but anyone who'd look at you could tell you've been through some shit. You've gotten your dues. Winston blushed and cleared his throat at the embarrassment of his ID. You know I'm underage? Well, no, but I do now. What's got you worked up, kid? Only time I've seen someone drinking alone like you is if they're running from something. Well... <laughs> What's there to say? Any for your thoughts? I like Western movies. What? John Wayne classics, you know, the oldies, like Rio Grande. I always thought Ricky Nelson was sexy. Winston bit his lip and got lost in his tap water. He looked back up at Lloyd. But not that I want to write him like a cowboy kind of trash. I just I always thought he was handsome. I used to be a choir boy when I was little. The gray streak in my hair is from polyosis. I just like pigment in the area, but I've always bullied for it. I've never flown a kite before. My favorite flower is an orchid. It doesn't matter the color, but I prefer violet. Oh, and this train ride, my parents kicked me out and cut me off of everything when they found me in bed with another guy, uh, sending me down to Florida to live with my aunt. Winston kept still and bit his lip as he looked into the nothingness of the counter. I know there's more, but that's all I can think of. Winston sighed and rubbed his fingers together, interlocking them as he noticed the tiny hairs that projected from pores. He had his mother's hands. He turned his left hand over and drew in his palm with his finger. He followed the curves and creases of his skin with fascination. He looked up at Lloyd. Questions, comments, concerns? Lloyd lit another cigarette and tapped its ashes onto the counter, knowing he could clean it up later. Fuck you up, your mom and dad, quoted Lloyd. He took a deep inhale from the butt of his cigarette and let it sit in his lungs until it stung. He let the smoke into the atmosphere of the now empty lounge. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. He nodded and tapped his ashes once more. I can't have kids. Winston slumped his cheek into his palm. Didn't you hear me? I'm fucking gay. It's not like building a fire, Lloyd. I can't rub two sticks together and whoosh. Winston fluttered his fingers through the air like sparks caught in an updraft. Lloyd just had to laugh. Kid, I've been a bartender longer than you'd think. It's not the first one I've seen. Winston leaned in, intrigued. I have these two guys, Michael and Andrew. 
that would come into my old bar at the end of every week. Always wanted to toast each other for getting through all the same shit. Different day, different life. Dark exhale with the shot chaser. They do this little thing where, where they pour each other's beer. I remember one day, Michael had come in alone, and I was setting up him and Andrew's drinks. And I was going to ask him where Andrew was, but then here he came in with a group of people and sat at a table. They didn't even acknowledge Michael. These people, you see, they were calling him Andy. I never called him that. He was always Andrew, you know? Michael sat at the bar. And he, he never turned around. Then he poured Andrew's beer and then his own. And everything just sat. Lloyd looked up at a teary eyed Winston. He couldn't tell what had struck the boy so close. Was Andrew's family, and their own son was a stranger to them. Give your parents time, son. Winston nodded and fluttered his eyelashes to keep his tears away. Time is all you need. It gives people time to think. It gives the wounds time to heal. Winston took a long, a hard sip of the room temperature tap water. He nodded and thought to himself, for a moment. Slow night, isn't it, Lloyd? He turned around again to the empty lounge and thought, what to do about Travis? What to do about his father? His mother? Himself? I'd say it's just picking up. 